what we're doing right now is to focus primarily on something along the lines of key locations. Or let's just determine... Let's just determine where this is taking place. Remember, we started this week's broadcast by going into... Uh, by going into the... You know, the races, and, and we talked a little bit about uh, some of the broader aspects so that we could do character creation. Now, what I think that we can do is let's explore the 10th district. Let's get a feel for our setting, especially because we already have a dungeon and we already have actors. Now we need to know the stage upon which they're going to play. And when we come back uh, after a, uh, after a break, we can then get into uh, ch combining chapter four here of creating adventures with, eh, you know, and maybe, you know, th they do provide some NPCs by uh, by guild. These are more like the big named characters. And I, I want to be... I want to make sure that you're careful. Not that you shouldn't use named characters. Uh, for example, Gideon Jura is name dropped in the adventure included in this uh in this uh supplement uh, called Krenko's Way. Uh Gideon Jura is a planeswalker uh from Magic the Gathering. And you know what? Jace Bellerin himself is innately tied to Ravnica. He is the he is the guild pact right now. So if you are if you're running a game, be sure that if you're going to name drop, that you uh, that you do so in a way that everyone is still going to have fun. And uh, so, for example, we wouldn't want suddenly, you know, you and, and four of your friends are sitting down at my table, and I'm going to run some Ravnica content for you. And all of a sudden, Jace shows up. Be careful about your adventure not just becoming the Jace show. Even if people at, at the table recognize the name or they play magic or they even really like Jace or really hate Jace. Um, if, you, if you name drop, you know, big, big figures, it can more easily allow for overshadowing of your own story and therefore your own PCs in your story to, to take place. Um, because they might just try and, and search after this powerful person and have the powerful person do stuff, uh, you know, with them or for them. And you know what? If that's part of your campaign and everyone likes it, go go for it. In general, I, I wanted to throw that out there, though. If you're going to run with a named character from something identifiable, it's like, you know, you, you do uh, a Harry Potter you know, a Wizarding World-style RPG, and, you know, suddenly Hermione shows up. It's a character with whom we're already very familiar. Many of us may even like. Um, but there may be that chance that the Hermione, in this instance, is going to overshadow uh, the events that take place. And you also run the risk of uh, you end up neutering the NPC. You know, so we have Jace, or we have Hermione... Uh, who come up to, you know, a bunch of level one characters saying, you're the only one who can help me with this. And that may be the case, or they may be just sort of, I don't know, testing them or whatnot. But suddenly, uh, you know, the, the players um, might feel a little jilted, even subconsciously, because they're, this big character is, you know, is not the character that they're used to. It's not a good representation of what they remember from their source. And if you're trying to pull on nostalgia or you're trying to pull on cool factor, um, well, just take that into consideration. Alexander, good morning to you and howdy to you, Numonica. Welcome. All right, so let's check out the 10th district. You can imagine that there's at least nine other districts that exist. I think we're going to get a good flavor of Ravnica by going to the 10th. And Cameron, it's good to see you. Thanks for stopping by. 
Uh, we ended up uh, we ended up raiding uh, Cameron last night, who was doing a very good job killing zombies. Uh, many more times than they killed him. <laughs> uh, Dice says Swoter uh, failed with this exact topic with Revan. Uh, I hated it with a great passion. Um, so, uh, can you expound on that a little bit more, Dice? Um, can you get a bit into how it was uh, not done properly? Either because the a character was over or underpowered or represented, or or the story was hinged on a major NPC, therefore the story was about the NPC and not the, the PCs. You're keeping them at bay. Well... Godspeed to you, Cameron. Someone's got to do it. 12 for 10. Good evening to you. All right. So here's our setting, right? We're, we're going to have... In fact, we can even retroactively apply that uh, Lone Survivor took place in the 10th District in one of the precincts. In fact, I think I know which precinct even. All right, anyway, the 10th District is a sprawling place. To be governed efficiently, it's broken into six precincts, each the size of a small city. This chapter describes the various features you can find in those wondrous places. Each precinct, as well as its distinct personality, is explored in its own section later in this chapter. Here are brief descriptions of each of them to help orient you before you tour, before your tour. Precinct 1. This is the hub of the wealthy and powerful, where courtly games and espionage play out among visitors gawking at the impressive architecture. The precinct is also known as the Guild Pact Precinct. Precinct 2. Many professionals live here in clean and orderly neighborhoods in the shadow of New Prov, while mob bosses coerce residents in order to enrich themselves and influence local politics. Precinct 3. In the Green Belt... Nature has encroached into the urban environment in varying degrees, and folk here provide bountiful sustenance and domesticated beasts for most of the district. Precinct 4. Constantly in a state of turmoil, the scarred streets of Precinct 4 are a proving ground for soldiers and marauders alike. Visitors here had best be spoiling for a fight. Precinct 5. Precinct 5 is where the, the learned folk of the 10th District gather to discuss theory or to put their knowledge to practical use in the precinct's many schools, libraries, and laboratories. And Precinct 6. In the hard scrabble neighborhoods of Precinct 6, the working folk eke out a living by toiling at warehouses, docks, and factories controlled by callous employers. When night comes, the residents hide indoors and avoid uh, to avoid becoming prey to creatures that stalk the darkness. As we were conceptualizing the, the prior campaign, it sounded like it took place in Precinct 6, although we never called it that. And as, as is good in storytelling and escalating the story or expanding the scope, the first campaign pretty much took place entirely in Precinct 6. We did mention that they would probably visit Precinct 1 for some official business, but everything took place in one precinct. And as you're telling a story, um, as you're telling a story, that's really good because you can develop the foundation, right? So this campaign that we're going to create, whatever it's going to end up being, is going to take place at least somewhat in Precinct 6, at least start there, and it's probably going to take us into another precinct. But we're going to spend more time there, and we might even touch upon the other precincts uh, briefly in some other way. So slowly, ever so slowly, as we go through these tiers of adventure that are going to formulate a campaign, we are getting an idea for more and more of the world, and our own comfort zone expands with the knowledge of the area in which we're playing. Uh, Dice says, yeah, uh, that last point mainly, you play the game throughout as kind of a heroic character in which, quote, the galaxy depends on your actions, blah, 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 and then Revan shows up and you're immediately playing second fiddle to an NPC that already had an entire game about him being the heroic character in which the galaxy depended upon. Revan is my second favorite uh, DLOTS, uh, Bane is number one, fight me, uh, but it just ruined him for me. And so, Dice, uh, thank you for uh, thank you for expanding on that idea and giving an example of it. You know, because we we might uh, 
you know, it, it's so tempting, right? That, you know, we want to name drop in our game. You know, maybe you want Dritzt, uh, Dritzt Orden to, to show up because, you know, a lot of people know him and, you know, he has a lot of fans. He has a lot of detractors, but he also has a lot of fans. Given all Dritz has done, right? Or if we're playing Lord of the Rings, you know, a Middle a Middle Earth RPG, you know, you want Strider to uh, to lead your party somewhere, then I I imagine a lot of people are going to be uh, depending upon an NPC in order to get the job done, and suddenly it becomes about the NPC. So you may uh, excellent excellent point, Dice. Thank you very much. Uh, Cameron also said, oh, hey, I think you dropped this. Uh, what, what, what do you mean that I, I dropped something, Cameron? Oh! Cameron, you have a fantastic Welsh accent. <laughs> Five months already. Well, you know what? And I, I hope to be around for many more for you and for others out there as we continue to inspire and tell stories and have fun and teach and welcome and welcome new players. Because, you know, Cameron, uh, you know, even though you're still new, you, you've already had a lot of experience. And especially with a community like this backing you up, you can more confidently invite more people to sit at your tabletop and play, whether it's virtual or in person. And we'll find more people and we'll have more fun and you all will be more confident, inspired storytellers in, in one way or another. Even if you don't agree with, uh, with something that I say or if I, if I present a mistake and you find it later. Um, you will still be a better person for that interaction, especially if it means you can come back and, and help me be a better person with a correction or a suggestion or something along those lines, uh, just through your participation. No desktop sounds? Uh, okay, there we go. Hopefully that'll... Uh... New Monica, people have heard of Dritz to Erden. Who knew? <laughs> Oh, there was no audio on that. Oh shoot! I'm sorry because I forgot to, I forgot to click it on once I once I changed screens. Ah, dang it. Well, to me, it was a beautiful Welsh accent, Cameron. You could reload the alert. Oh, I, I can, can't I, huh? This, this might be it. Thank you. What am? It's been pimp month, salriadi. I guess time does flew here at Irland, venturing through half the land. Glad I went down, man. Here is the one of the rest of my month, guides here, and have all the beautiful Welsh accent. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know what the Australian is for, um, the Australian accent is, um, bits or donations. <laughs> All right, so. This is an overview of the precincts. Each precinct section includes two tables that can help you as DM improvise as characters explore that part of the city. 
When a character wants to talk to a person on the street, you can roll on the people in the street table for the precinct. Unless otherwise noted, these NPCs can be of any race. They might use the monster manual stat blocks for commoners, guards, or other creatures at your discretion. Whenever characters are gathering information or talking with contacts in a precinct, you can use the rumors table for the precinct to add some flavor to their interactions or to generate adventure hooks. It's so it, it's going to go through major tradeways. There's Tin Street and the Trans Guild Promenade, or Promenade, depending on how you would want to pronounce it. And there's definitely an area that's beneath the streets. This under uh, this uh, this under city. Uh, immediately underground are the city works, such as the sewers and the transit system. Below the complex network of tunnels and passages that make up the city. Uh, works lie in the Undercity, a realm populated by creatures that shun the surface world. And by the way, make no mistake, Ravnica is modern in many ways. I mean, look. Look at, the, uh, look at some of the cosmopolitan conveniences you have. You have a cup of coffee, right? Ten copper or a silver piece. New the Newspapers. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Look at those emotes. <laughs> Pendulum clock. Spectacles, right? So we, we have a level of uh, technology and or magic that can allow for vision to be corrected mundanely. And can any of you tell me why a spyglass is included and why a spyglass would be between 50 and 100 gold pieces? Why would they include this as a cosmopolitan convenience for you all to consider? Hey, Daniel, welcome. You're here for the free bag of holding? Well, uh, much like uh, B uh, much like Bethesda, Daniel, I promised a free bag of holding, and uh, instead I gave you just a burlap sack. I'll be waiting here forever. Yeah, I'm a miser about bags of holding. That's true. Because it is for spying on damsels in the bathing room and uh, has seen some scary things by accident. <laughs> uh, well, there's probably a good amount of spying that goes on. But here, let me let me assist, if I may, for you all's consideration. Here's our core player's handbook. Dice says, Spyglasses let you look at an opponent's hand in Ravnica. You then choose the name of a card. That card... Oh. <laughs> nah, I gotcha. So, why would a Spyglass in the core player's handbook be a thousand gold pieces, but only 50 to 100 gold pieces in Ravnica? And yes, a thousand gold is a lot of money, Coffee Cat. For the consideration of the Midnight Society. Orcs, you, you gotta sprinkle the powder on the fire as you say that. Uh, getting into the embassy is gonna be hard. That place is locked up tighter than a miser's purse. So one of the points of showcasing that you can get a spyglass in Ravnica... For 50 to 100 gold, as opposed to our sort of generic D&D &D world of 1,000, shows the level of advanced technology or engineering or sciences uh, and or magic. And think of this too. If we can buy newspapers, what does that indicate exist on Ravnica? Yeah. 
Hey, Rhodium got it. Printing presses. So, complex optics that can make corrective lenses, which can demonstrate um, engi like engineering and uh, and medical, uh, you know, medical considerations are available. Um, precise, you know, uh, binoculars and spy glasses. Uh, you know, the level of technology and the resources to make them are so prevalent that spy glasses cost uh, only 5 to 10% of the cost of a normal spy glass in another D&D &D world. Right, tell we're in a whole new era of Civ over here. Yes, we are. And look at this, too. What is this indicating, right? What would a cup of coffee here indicate? I mean, if we can presume you could find a cup of coffee anywhere in Ravnica, not only then are there places that grow coffee, there are places that process it, and there's the means to transport coffee all over Ravnica from wherever it's harvested. So these these items uh, these items are indicative of so much more that takes place, right? This is cosmopolitan. It's indicating what exists in society and what you might have access to. Alexander says, Maddie, what would you say if I'd like to play some role-playing in English, but I don't know it so well as English-speaking people? Should I be a character with, with a strong Russian accent? I'd like not to be and avoid somehow this problem. What do you think? Alexander, if you're playing with a group who knows that English is not your first language, don't, you know, you don't have to pretend to speak with a Russian accent. Try speaking differently you know if you think that you're speaking uh, uh with an english accent uh through your own native uh speaking skills then do so if you want a character that has a spanish accent uh you know despite your your russian heritage then do so don't you know don't worry about uh playing into an accent or into some sort of expectation challenge yourself and play your character if you don't know a particular word that's fine uh, you can use other words to describe it or you can do what i do and i keep uh i keep uh some some windows on my computer off screen that are open for translation pages for a dictionary um and in other such uh other such conveniences so that way, if I come across something that I need more information about, I can quickly reference it. And that might be a good way for you to strengthen your English speaking skills and your vocabulary in an environment in which everyone knows that's what you're trying to do and wants to help you enhance your skills. Uh, Rodium says, uh, if we can rehydrate coffee, we can rehydrate noodles. Thus, cup of ramen exists. That could very well be. You could probably go to, uh, you know, sort of like a quick ramen shop somewhere in Ravnica. Numanica says, it deserves mentioning that any kind of spyglass or telescope is a rather advanced device. The first patent for a telescope was in 1608. Uh, Numanica continues to Alexander. Every time the GM fakes an accent, everybody accepts it. If you don't sound like a quote-unquote native speaker, I wouldn't worry. It's the same thing. You're faking it just like everyone else. 
Daniel says in Monica they have guns and steam engines. Well, spy glasses are not that advanced. Rhodium says Mnemonica, screw the spyglass, ramen is possible. And Dice says, that's astounding to be honest. Something as simple as a cup of coffee completely changes the world from ale-drinking barbarians to technologically savvy free thinkers. And, you know, just by, just by asking yourself this question, wait, we can buy a newspaper? What does that mean? Hold on, spyglasses... Oh, something, they're on sale because I remember in the PHB because of the exorbitant price, right? So something like this is probably because our default D&D &D world is 1200 AD, you know? But as Pneumonica pointed out, we're entering into the Renaissance period. We might even be in some kind of a, uh, an equivalent of a uh, of the 1800s with the Industrial Revolution, right? There's an entire street that's just nothing but factories. And you know what? When you have a planet-wide city, you need to make stuff. You need to constantly make stuff, and recycle and 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 do all of this. So we could very well be in more of an 1800s. Right? You, if you want to make it sort of Edwardian or Victorian era England, if you want to make it 1800s, uh, you know, Industrial Revolution uh, United States, uh, if you want to have it be some kind of, um, uh, you know, if you want to look at it as uh, maybe a more modern example, you know, we have China that is uh, that is modernizing. Right? They're embracing uh, they're embracing technology more. Uh, money is, uh, I mean, despite the, the proclaimed, uh, you know, economic and political system is, uh, is growing and pooling and shifting, um, more than, than it ever has been, right? More modern cities are being adopted as well as modern cultures. And, and yet, so, so we're seeing, we're seeing an area that exists in the same time that we are, where, you know, wherever we're at. But they uh, they're getting to do so very rapidly because of the conditions that exist. And so you know you could think of Ravnica as uh, as like a Hong Kong uh, or Shanghai. It's probably like one of the more special economic zones in China. If you know if you're familiar, uh, I don't think we need to go into global uh, global socioeconomics. <laughs> we can. You want to talk Ravnica? Let's go into global socioeconomics, everyone. Let's put our D&D books down, and I'll crack open... I, I, I taught econ. We'll crack open our econ books, and, and we'll get into... Uh, and we'll get into this. <laughs> but but this the all of these are indicative of the world in which we are going to be living. Right? If there are printing presses... You know, when was the, uh, when was the printing press... Uh, I mean, I, we could say invented, but, you know, when was it really popularized to the point where newspapers were a weekly or, you know, bi-weekly, weekly, or even a daily thing? You know, are, are we around the time, uh, are, are we pre-industrial revolution? More like, you know, the 1700s, uh, colonial, uh, colonial uh, United States? I mean, to be, to be, uh, like, ethnocentric, I suppose, because that's, that's, growing up, that's what I was used to studying. The industrialization at its finest, steampunk D&D. And you know what? Eberron is really good for that too, uh, Dice. Uh, Rytel says, books should probably be less expensive than the player's handbook as well if printing presses are prevalent enough to have newspapers be common. Uh, yes, Rytel, that is another extrapolation we can take from this. That is absolutely one. Pneumonica uh, to Daniel. Yes, they are. The first steam turbine is from 1551. Was that the Sterling engine? Uh, the first personal firearms are from 1250. The spyglass is uh, down line from those. Truly, ramen is the pinnacle of all civilized society. <laughs> all sorts of, uh, you know, there's all sorts of languages as well. 
So anyway, we have our uh, we, we had our, our very basic introduction um, to the precincts, primarily from its description. Let's study Precinct 6, because I think a lot of our action is going to originate from here, and we're going to re at least return to here often, even though we might be taken to another precinct. By the way, this is an interesting side note, the Millennial Platform. Anchored by enormous chains at the juncture of Precincts 1, 3, and 4, the Millennial Platform is a floating observation deck that affords the best overhead view of the 10th District. The most exclusive restaurant in the district is located here. Every citizen is given a token that can be redeemed for one airship ride to the platform any time during the coming year. But those who want to dine in the Millennial Restaurant might have to make a reservation months in advance. Now, as we can see, here is a very nice map of uh, just what it is uh, we are we're looking at. And you can see, just like Sharn in Eberron, Ravnica is is a very vertical city. I mean, look how in Precinct 6, right? So this is, this is more like the ghetto area, um, more of the depressed area, you know, low-income housing and, and the like. Probably a lot of, of public, uh, public uh, housing and works and such. You know, so this descends down further into like the the crust of Ravnica here. But look up here uh towards uh here's precinct 4. Look how high up it is above others. And by the way, if you do want to name drop and you want to have an accurate map, New Prov the V2 Ghazi. Maybe these are names that are familiar to you. Or Zova. Right? Here's the common fortress. Maybe this is the Raman fortress. <laughs> right? Now, now let's come over. Precinct 1 and 2. So the, the very wealthy ones here. Precinct 3 is the green belt, right? Very naturalized. You know, it, it is urban, but they, they still have, uh, they still have uh, boulevards uh, that have, uh, you know, uh, street line or uh, tree line streets, you know, sidewalks and the like. Here's the Trans Guild Promenade up here. Cuts through. Keeps going down this way. And it can, it'll take you, uh, it'll take you past or through or over the different areas which are going to be uh, sort of lorded over by the different guilds that are going to be prominent there. Hey, Lord Sathar, uh, do you think Ravnica and Sigil seem similar? Uh, from, from what I know of Sigil, yes. Uh, I would say that um, Ravnica, you can use Ravnica as a very firm foundation that you can make your own sigil without needing uh, wizards to print uh, an actual sigil book. Now, of course, sigil is mentioned in the core rule books and you can find it elsewhere. And, and you can find side articles about what sigil is. Um... But if you want mechanics, if you want that, uh, we like we're a hub not just for ourselves, but we're a hub for the multiverse. You know, so many people come here to do so many different things. So Ravnica is utilitarian in that regard, uh, Lord Sathar. Fluffy sheep D and D is full of anachronisms. It doesn't reflect real history. It's Renaissance fair medieval. <laughs> Hey, Daily, welcome. I'm sorry, I'm just catching up in chat here. Artifact firearm from uh, 1396 in Europe. And yeah, anachronisms do happen, Fluffy Sheep. You make a very good point. It's like wearing chainmail and cotton underwear together. But isn't that how you do it? <laughs> uh, 
All right, sewers. They have them. Therefore, indoor plumbing is a thing. You know, in our Tuesday game, I, I sort of played up the fact that in, in the penthouse suite, they have access to indoor plumbing. Now, it may very well be that servants behind the wall just sort of like, you know, pour water into a, uh, into a boiler or like a, into a tank. And you, and you pull the lever and so gravity feeds water down on you to be a, sho a shower, right? Or there's a, a bath that's freely available. But that's a big thing. So sewers here are also indicative of the, of the lifestyle, the technology, and the culture that exist here. And they're, oh, they are both ruled by guilds. So there you go, Lord Sathar. Uh, different pipe tunnels, transit tunnels, magically charged tracks line the floor of uh, tube-like tunnels that send vehicular constructs to major locations in the 10th district and beyond. The tunnels open into small stations that have staircases leading up to the surface. Eberron has, uh, has stuff like this as well. So once more, here we are, we're finding a subway system, you know, a rail system. There we go. Dice, thanks, Rome, for taking my poop away from my house. <laughs> All sewage leads to Rome. Well, from it, hopefully, not to it. <laughs> Coffee Cats and M5 must be rolling in the tourism industry, now that I'm really thinking about it. It could. There could also be other reasons why in this uh, small country city, you have... You have the mega wealthy flower field family or places that can host others who would expect indoor plumbing. Everything is there for a reason, Coffee Cat, if you are willing to look into it. So what you said could be very relevant to Tuesday. And by the way, it is almost Tuesday. Um, all right, so there's a lot of other locations, uh, things that you can, uh, things that you can name drop, concepts you can use. <coughs> Pardon me. There's our precinct one. We're gonna go to six. And here we go. Large warehouses, major thoroughfares, and nondescript worker tenements make the utilitarian Precinct 6 a hub of activity for shipping, storage, and other mercantile concerns in the 10th District. Wide cobblestone streets allow for the passage of beasts and constructs that transport raw goods from this point beyond the 10th and for the shipping of manufactured materials back to those locations. The demands of commerce keep the area constantly active, and the inconspicuous nature of the warehouses make them popular as rendezvous points for all sorts of trans uh, transactions, legal and illicit. At night, lurking undead and the horrors of the Undercity coming up from the Dead Bridge Chasm keep wary citizens indoors, while a few people who deal in sinister magic seek the monsters out for nefarious purposes. People who live in this working-class precinct are often practical-minded and thus tolerant of some degree of illicit activity. Being a good neighbor means keeping to yourself unless you like, uh, unless you live in the smelting quarter, where the atmosphere is much more raucous. The Orzov Syndicate owns many of the warehouses in the precinct and controls much of the commerce around Tin Street. Hey, so again, this is what we had set up uh, accidentally on purpose in our last campaign. The Boros Legion, yay, also the same, uh, rents many of the warehouses to store manufactured goods from the smelting quarter, and uh, Common Fortress houses a garrison to protect Boros interests. The Cult of Rakdos, which we, was also included in the last campaign, operates a number of uh, pain clubs throughout the precinct, especially around Tin Street, 
and Rakdos, uh, and Rakdos street performances are more common in Precinct 6 than anywhere else in 10th District. Where does Niv Mizzet stay? Uh, Niv Mizzet is going to stay in... Uh, there's the blister coils. Uh, but there is... Um... Not Scar. Uh, Nivix, I believe, is the home of uh, of Niv Mizzet. Yeah. One of the tallest towers in Ravnica, this impressive structure crackles with the wild power of the Izzet and serves as their guild hall. Filled with laboratories, testing facilities, and housing for their inventors, Nivix is the center of Izzet innovation. So right here. All right, uh, so here we're going to get a little bit more detailed information. What What is here? The smelting quarter, heart of the manufacturing industry in the 10th district, is at the north end of the precinct. The smelting quarter is smoky, hot, and filled with activity day and night. Goblins often make their homes near the factories on Foundry Street, preferring the constant activity to sleepier neighborhoods. Standing south and east of the quarter, Common Fortress is a Boros garrison dedicated to keeping watch on Rakdos activity. Clashes between the Boros Legion, the Goblin, and the Cult of Rakdos, the Goblins and the Cult of Rakdos, are common throughout this part of the precinct. The Gore House. A Rakdos club called the Gore House, run by a Viashino, or a lizard folk, uh, named Nyoser, occupies a defunct factory in the south end of the smelting quarter, and also houses the main entrance to the demon's vestibule, the stairway down to Rick's Madi. Midori Park, western uh, part of the precinct, Midori Park, is named after an Orzov pontiff who uh, converted a city park into a warehouse lot many years ago. This neighborhood is particularly rife with undead at night, both corporeal and incorporeal. Some serve dark masters and often guard valuables, while others pursue their own evil urges. The Orzov syndicate owns many large warehouses here, and the Boros Legion maintains facilities to store a variety of equipment used by their soldiers, including valuable weapons and armor. The most important facilities are heavily guarded, often by Angels, <laughs> whether Boros or Orzov. Dreadbridge Chasm, a gaping opening in the ground, dominates the precinct and is lined with mossy stairs and fungal blooms. Deadbridge Chasm serves as an entrance to the Golgari's Undercity Realm and their guild hall, Kor uh, Korozda. Hey, what are two other PCs we randomly generated this week for our story? The Golgari! Does this not work out very well for us? The area smells of decomposition, an odor that grows particularly intense on hot days. Many crawl, make their homes in the walls that line the cavernous descent, and Devkarin elves come at uh, drow for Ravnica. And Devkarin elves come up to the surface through this passage to trade on Tin Street. The neighborhood of Wayport rises like a pillar from the midst of the Dread Bridge Chasm, and a number of bridges, large and small, connect it to the surrounding city of multiple vertical levels. Many goods traded with other districts are funneled along Tin Street, often pausing in Wayport's warehouses along the way, but only the wealthiest merchants can afford storage space here. And Benzer's Bridge. This wide bridge is a main thoroughfare for cargo traveling to and from districts beyond the 10th. A small market is located here, complete with shops and restaurants, all of which close after dark. Secret pain clubs, and perhaps pleasure clubs too, 
uh, hidden below <coughs> the market in dark rooms inside the bridge itself come alive after sunset. Yep, Rick's Mati, the Guild Hall of the Cult of Rectos. Dun dun dun. Rhodium says ghost types are the best types. Pain, pleasure, same difference, and Dice agrees. <laughs> Alright, so now we're getting into what are the goods and services that can be acquired here? Um, different, uh, so what what would be considered good or bad and who who's going to enforce the law especially in a place like this which is going to be more prone towards conflict and violence and chaos uh you know it's a hotbed of illicit activity particularly organized crime which is what our two anti-heroes engage in so they it works out very well all right typical response time to reported crime in these areas is 2d 10 minutes the squad consists of two Boros soldiers. At night or in the smelting quarter, a response to an attack might instead consist of 1d4 soldiers led by a sergeant. And of course, you know, as a DM, having charts like this can be very useful. Who exists in this area and what might they know? Right? A merchant looking for a Rakdos club, a metalsmith, grimy from a long day's work. A teamster spoiling for a fight. Various rumors. Did you hear those shrieking sounds out near Benzer's Bridge last night? Whatever it was, it, it didn't sound like anything I've ever heard before. Chilling. I heard the Krenko's gang has been trying to get their hands on Mythium and are willing to pay a good price for it, too. That was, I, I, that was, I was trying to do a Ferengi impression. <laughs> Mythium is probably the closest we'll get to Latinum, which, of course, is, uh, is favored because it's a metal that can't be replicated in Star Trek and therefore it has value. <laughs> Quark! <laughs> <laughs> Answer me. <laughs> Dice says, I doubt shrieks would be a mystery around those parts with the undead doing their shopping every night after dark. And you know what? Uh, we brought this up. Uh, we brought this up uh, before, when we were making our cleric, our order cleric. In Ravnica, you have to super watch out if you're going to use turn undead as a paladin or as a cleric. And arguably, uh, arguably even fiends and fey, uh, because I know the paladins have some specific ones there too. If you're going to use a turn ability. You have to be careful in Ravnica because you can turn an innocent citizen who's, you know, minding their own business and or destroy what people consider property. Right. If you are uh, if you're a, a paladin looking to hunt down, um, you know, hunt down, uh, I don't know. You're after uh, like a demure skeleton that's, you know, running a spy operation or something and you go to turn it. You can blast uh, an Orzov ghost that was just kind of hanging around, seeing what was happening. Right? Because it's 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 indiscriminate. You know, some of these are just AOEs around you. And so think of that. This is a Kit Kat, by the way. I'm having a snack. Uh, remember, in generic Western European fantasy D&D, &D, undead aren't that common. And so being anti-undead is a popular position. On Ravnica, being anti-undead uh, can earn you the ire of at least three different guilds. Because those guilds have and use undead. Unintelligent and, in and intelligent alike.
<laughs> Rudy, yeah. Yeah, you're gonna have to overturn someone's cabbage cart. <clears throat> you wanna make a loxodon a loxodon druid? Any particular inspiration for that combo? Right? Here's a very good picture of what a what could a common street look like. Right? Looks like it might have just rained recently. There's some reflections, some you know, some water's caught in the cobbles. All sorts of people are out. You know, so here's a Vidalkin talking with others. Um, we have some large beasts of burden uh, carrying passengers, probably hauling supplies of some kind. People pushing carts, and there's different stalls. Uh, here we have some representatives of the Azorius Senate. Looks like they're they're trying to keep the peace. You know, you can see that the, the city is just vertical and vertical and vertical. Heck, I'm surprised you don't see, um, you know, some skyjacks or angels kind of flying overhead, too, on a patrol. Or, or going out to put put down some sort of like, um, uh, like a riot or something. Oh, hey, spot the goblin. There's one. I don't think I see, uh, I don't think I see a minotaur and I don't see Waldo. But anyway, you get the idea, right? So the sixth precinct is going to be home to our characters, and it's going to be where a lot of our activity takes place. So now that we're more familiar with it, with its uh, with its geography, uh, we're familiar with uh, you know the guilds that are stationed there. We can we can better tailor what we want our. Uh, what we want our PCs to engage with over the course of the story that we're going to present to them. Lord uh, Sethar wants to be a, a Simic, uh, like a, a hybrid, uh, a Simic hybrid paladin. Right, Tal says, I want to make a Demir Barbarian who exists to be the distraction. <laughs> That would be very interesting. <laughs> now, the other location that we would probably visit, or rather locations, to at least be somewhat familiar with, is going to be Uh, Precinct 2, because I believe that's where the Azorius are going to be. You want to come up and say hi? Come on. And we have a cat. We have a snack. It's an official stream, everyone. Let's see. We need... Precinct 1. All the guilds are interested here. Yeah, so we're we're looking more into Yep, New Prov is in Precinct 2. So, uh, we'll want to we'll want to reference this when they go there because the 
One of the NPCs we made is a contact who works uh, within the bureaucracy of the Azorius Senate. And so they may actually need to go and visit New Prov in order to acquire something, stop a deal, or otherwise work with this homunculus. This uh, homunculus NPC. New Prov is the tallest structure in the 10th district. The austere New Prov consists of three towering columns, reminding everyone of the omnipresence of the Azorius Senate. Each column serves as the headquarters for one of the three branches of the Senate. Inside, space, uh, spacious chambers on the lower floors give way to a host of offices upstairs where day-to-day -day assignments are issued and the strategy of maintaining law is continually honed. And we also generated a uh, we also generated a prison that our characters are most likely going to have to have a prison break out of. Though where that was described would be uh, it was more like in the branches of a great tree, and so that would be over here, um, probably in well in, in precinct three here with uh, the Celestia Conclave. Uh, V2 Ghazi is the Celestia Guild Hall. The canopy, the northern neighborhood of the precinct, is covered in tall trees, all of which are overshadowed by V2 Ghazi. To accommodate a growing population, buildings are situated around the trees and on the larger branches, making use of a network of ladders and rope walkways. So this is going to be where our dungeon, quote-unquote, is going to be when we have our prison break dungeon as a part of the campaign that we're going to be presenting to the party that we have generated over the course of the week. So here's Precinct 3. People and rumors. Hey, an awakened shrub completing an errand. Wouldn't that be something, right? Suddenly we're we're playing uh we're playing a Zelda RPG and it's a Deku scrub. A farmer using a healing balm after a hard day. A Ledev guardian on patrol. Uh, we popped a miniature of that. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, like a ranger riding a dire wolf. Oh, have to we have to have cat butt for it to be official? Oh no, Raichi. You got to show your butt for this to be an official stream. Rumors? No, something keeps spooking the pack animals. I wonder what it could be. We should go find that Loxodon priest and see if she's still having visions. I'll bet we can get her to tell us our future. Right? All this is providing good flavor for the type of thing that you would see or hear while you are traversing this precinct of the of the district. As a, you know, as a player character, I obviously it be careful about reading this stuff as a player character because you might spoil a surprise or you might, um, I don't know. You know, if you heard, um, I don't know, as a player, if you heard the rumor, can you believe they're going to close V2 Ghazi for, to visitors tomorrow? I wonder what's going on. That in some way might, might give you meta knowledge clues about what's, uh, what to expect or what could be going on. Now, I understand that you can meta a lot of this, if especially if you're already familiar with uh, Ravnica through Magic the Gathering. But, you know, just be careful about it. Uh, open yourself up to the flavor, to the experience, to the sights, the smells. Remember, as a Loxodon, that is, that's one of your strong points, is you get to use your smell at advantage. As a DM... That means your players are going to want to use smell to their advantage. So make sure that when you are describing a place, you have that as a consideration for where uh, where your players are and what's happening in the world around them.
So there we go. Precinct 3 is, is pretty well Celestia territory. So this will really just be the site of our dungeon. Uh, whereas the majority of the story is going to take place between uh, 6 and 2. And of course, you know, the the Trans Guild Promenade uh, will allow for uh, facilitation. We have subways. There are airships. Um, it was talking about, actually, if we come back up here. Uh, Augustin Station, the main airship station for the 10th District. Augustin Station is located at the western end of Griffin Heights. Travelers from all over Ravnica are carried in various forms of air travel. From gondolas hung from giant balloons to compartments strapped to the backs of enormous floating beasts bred by the Simic Combine. Augustin Station has 20 platforms, with flights arriving and leaving at all hours. The most popular flight is to the Millennial Platform, a journey that costs five silver pieces per passenger. Other flights uh, carry passengers to smaller stations in each precinct of the 10th District. Um to large stations in each other district and to various other stations around the world. Mundane transportation is uh, very alive and well. He's getting spoiled. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to town on his noggin here. So there's so much wonderful fluff, um, you know, for what we're going to be doing tonight. I'm not going to go through the entire book. I think you can get a good idea, though, of just what is inside of this book for you as a PC and an NPC. Now that we've discussed our setting, I think that we're going to be prepared to, uh, to make the outline of our campaign. But before I do that, I want to take a 10 minute break. You know, let's, let's get up and let's use our indoor plumbing, everyone. Uh, you know, if you need a snack or a drink, go ahead and, and get up and, and, uh, and, you know, indulge. You know, if you have a, a pet next to you, you know, give them a little bit of love here. There, there's a cat butt. It's a stream. Ta-da. Bye. Will I see you in 10 minutes also? <laughs> and uh, when we come back, let's go through the Dungeon Master's Guide in conjunction with creating a campaign through the materials presented here in Ravnica especially. And let's let's do just that. Uh, we don't need any sort of fancy writing, um, you know, techniques. Um, we don't need a lot of extra practice because the books are going to hold our hand. And going through the motions here, I hope you'll see just how much awesome information is here. And especially if you have writer's block or, you know, if you're a DM and you're just like, I don't know where this is going. What should I do next? This is going to help you answer those questions. Okay. So let's meet back here in 10 minutes. What do you say, everyone? <laughs> 